welcome to Second Tech, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Finance Minister Tito Mboweni on Wednesday delivered his maiden medium-term budget policy statement speech. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss some of the key issues that were highlighted. Hi Terence. Hi Samal. The medium-term budget policy statement was delivered against the backdrop of declining revenues, a weak growth outlook and concerns about corruption. What were some of the main points uh, raised in this regard? Well, I think the a key point, as, as you mentioned, is this low growth pr uh, trajectory that South Africa is on. Again, our growth outlook has been revised down by the National Treasury to 0.7% from 1.5% in February when the, when the budget was delivered then by then Malusi Gigaba was the finance minister. This is in line very much with what the IMF is saying for South Africa's growth outlook. And once you have weak growth, sort of the house of cards starts tumbling all uh, uh, you know, down. And what we see is on the revenue side, we're seeing a very dismal and a little bit of a shocking projection coming out of this medium-term budget policy statement, with collections going to be in the range of between 20 and 30 billion lower in the three-year horizon than what was forecast in the budget. Now, a large portion of that seems to be related to um, under, uh, uh, the need to refund VAT from SARS. Now, we've been hearing for many years that st uh, stars it's all but stalled in refunding uh, VAT to those who are due it. And uh, that is now going to have to be paid. And the new acting commissioner made it clear that this is going to be, uh, be a priority for SARS to get that VAT back to those who are due it, uh, those VAT refunds. But it's having an impact on revenue. And then also we've seen slippage on the deficit. And we've seen a real rise in the debt burden. And I think but one of the scary numbers out of this medium-term budget policy statement is the fact that we're going to reach a debt-to-GDP level of close to 60%, just outside this three-year horizon. And that is a, a, a very high peak. And uh, I think we, there's going to have to be some conversations with the rating agencies, most two of which have already downgraded us. One is which has held us at investment grade to say, honestly, this is, uh, uh, is a slippage, and, um, but this is the plan. Um, and that was the highlight, I suppose, of the other side of the coin, was the highlight of the, the uh, medium-term budget, budget, budget policy statement was uh, this issue of um, how it's being aligned to this uh, economic stimulus and recovery plan that the President unveiled in September. How did the Minister seek to align the budget policy statement with the uh, economic stimulus and recovery package? Well, we know it's very difficult to stimulate uh, as government when you're in this sort of fiscal predicament where your revenues are falling, you've got a, a debt ceiling, you've got a high wage bill, you've got a growing interest bill. Uh, finding stimulus within that is difficult. And what the president's recovery and stimulus plan is all about is, is looking to reprioritize, knowing that there is a lot of wastage in the system, that there are projects that are slipping behind schedule or are not being delivered and therefore getting it into more fast delivery type projects and interventions. And I think at the heart of uh, the reprioritization, we, we knew that that was a 50 billion rand figure. What we can see directly in this medium term framework is 32 billion rand, which has been reprioritized. And a good portion of that goes to sort of quick delivery infrastructure projects. A lot of that relates to th th around health and uh, education infrastructure. So there's a big focus in the in this uh, next three years on, for instance, dealing with this terrible pit latrine problem at the schools. I mean, we've had deaths around this. It's a very big safety issue at a number of, of basic education institutions, and we need to sort that out. And I think there's now priority attention given to that. And then <coughs> there's the issue of the infrastructure fund that the president announced. And some flesh was added to those bones, not a lot but basically saying there is this commitment to setting up this fund, crowding in uh, private and development finance capital, as well as expertise, because a lot of the problem relates to bad project, um, uh, project preparation and getting that into the system and getting infrastructure going. And then I think some innovation from the new f uh, finance minister in the sense that where we've got an immediate crisis with uh, infrastructure that's deteriorated rapidly, in the Vol system, we know that there's pollution going into that system. That they've actually, he's approached the president, uh, who's given him the go ahead to approach the military through the defense minister 
to use their engineering capabilities to sort that out quickly. So that's quite innovative. I think you know, the, the military has engineering capabilities, and uh, this is something well within the, the, the you know within their their means to to fix. And I think we're going to see soldiers on the ground down at the Vol River system to try and help sort out something that really shouldn't have got to that point. And then also this terrible uh, water situation up in Guiani that's just been lingering and lingering. I think putting a, a focus on that and uh, emergency focus on that again, I think as part of this reprioritization. So I think there was alignment very much around the infrastructure side. Um, and then uh, to get to that 50 billion level, there's been some tweaking of the, the way grants in the system are going to work and things like that. So that there is money that's going to be directed to projects that are shovel ready or projects that are actually delivering and not just sitting on uh, uh, as a line item for projects that have not been prepared properly and are not being delivered. Boweni indicated that South Africa is at a crossroads. What hints did he give as to what path South Africa should be taking? Well, I think it was actually a bit of a breath of fresh air for most of us listening to uh, the, the new minister. He is a very confident individual. He comes out of uh, with you know a great pedigree. He was in the Nelson Mandela cabinet as a labor minister. He he was the governor of the Reserve Bank, the eighth governor of the Reserve Bank, which he kept emphasizing in his speech. And so he has confidence, and he uh, he used that uh, used the the honeymoon period, should we say, that it, uh, that uh, has been created by the fact that he replaced Clantlinani at such short notice, and therefore you know uh, he's had two weeks to prepare for this budget, and he's just come back from the private sector wilderness into the cabinet, so he's using this period to sort of send signals, and I think the, some of the interesting signals is that. You know, a lot of the debates uh, um, that we that we that are underway in South Africa around the economy, around state-owned companies, are driven by ideology, not by reality. And he's, he's sort of saying, you know, guys, we're in a, we're in a pickle. We've got a real situation around our growth. We've got a real problem with our rising debt, and we've got a real delivery problem, and uh, in some ways, some areas structural problems uh, at municipalities, but also at state-owned companies. And he, he made it quite clear that we need to be open-minded in the way we tackle these. We can't have a, a you know, a, a backward-looking approach, an ideological model. For, for instance, he mentions Eskom as being one of them, saying that you know that we may need to restructure this fundamentally to make it fit for purpose. We may have to separate the generation as assets out, allow for an independent grid company that we can hook both Eskom's generation assets up to, as well as independent power producers. He said, you know, we have to, you know, look at what we've got, look at, have a modern and open mind to these issues. We can't just be throwing money at a national airline forever and ever a day, uh, ever in a day. We need to actually try and uh, deal with the, the fundamental issues that make this airline loss making. So I think it was uh, quite refreshing. Um, uh, also, some of the things he said around water, some of the things he said around agriculture and land. You know, saying, you know, you, we might be focusing on land ownership, but it's not just ownership, it's about expertise and partnership. I think that was the real theme, that that's part of the crossroad. If we're going to choose a path, the path should be one of partnership. And we can lean oh, where there is skill in the private sector. For instance, the engineering capability in the private sector that could help with the water crisis or the transport crisis. Um, we could use the expertise in the private health sector to really get our hospitals, our public hospitals working in a better way than they are at the moment. So that whole theme of partnership, I think he, he tried to emphasize, and that there is goodwill uh, in, in the private sector to actually help government out. And then, but he said, you know, we also need to be realistic around uh, the way we, f we pay for infrastructure. Now, this is not going to go down well. He wasn't there as a popularity contest, obviously. And he was, one on the one hand, uh, attacking populism, and on the other hand, becoming quite unpopular in the sense that he said, you know, the user pay principle is something that we can't abandon. We need to pay for electricity. Municipalities need to be able to have a model that allows them to pay for electricity. And where we've got a service level agreement and a contract in place to have, for instance, toll roads, we need to pay for those tolls. And uh, that, I'm sure, went down like a lead balloon. 
But I think in some ways it's, it's more frank, it's more honest, it's getting to the issues uh, without, uh, you know, without you know, glossing over them and uh, glibly and saying we need to have a different conversation in South Africa if we're really going to extricate ourselves, one, from this low growth trap that we're in. And without getting out of this low growth trap, we've got no chance of dealing with the issues of unemployment. And if we don't deal with the issue of unemployment, we've got no way of pushing back poverty and the inequality crisis just gets deeper. So I think it was refreshing um, whether how long he can sustain that sort of independent open mind, uh, almost separate from what his cabinet colleagues may be doing. Uh, I mean, another point made was the size of the cabinet. He said in a country this size, the cabinet should never have more than 20 individuals in it. I mean, we've got a system, that a framework that has something like closer to 70 people in it. And he says there, there has to be signals right from the top. How many advisors do ministers have? How many staff do they employ just for their ministry? And what cars do they drive? You know, those sort of things. <laughs> I think, OK, so on the one hand, unpopular issues of that we need to pay for services that are delivered. We need to pay even tolls. Uh, on the other hand, I think this is also what South Africa wants to hear around you know, being a bit more uh, rational with the way we spend our money right from the top. And, and I think if we get it right at the top, it should filter down all the way to the bottom. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.